Well, what's up, everybody? Here we go with chapter three of Romans. Today, we're looking at the first 20 verses. I want to change up the format a bit today and give you the highlighted points at the beginning. So our, our main takeaways are going to be, number one, that no person can ever live up to the righteous standard of God. And this is really the closing of that point, a point we've talked about for several weeks now. Ever since chapter 1, verse 18, Paul has been revealing how every human being is unrighteous and deserves the wrath of God. From evil pagans all the way to God's very own people, we are all under sin. The second point for today is that Jesus has delivered the message that Israel was entrusted with and failed to deliver. And that one will make more sense as we get into today's verses. And now that I've given you the answers to the test, I'm sure that some of you won't watch from this point forward, so I'll see you next week. But for the rest of us, here we go with Romans chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though, every one were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. So at the end of chapter two, Paul really comes at the Jews. Remember, he said, you are God's special people, yet you lie and steal too. You have the special mark of circumcision, but your hearts haven't been marked, which is more important. So a natural response to that would be for them to say, well, what's the point in even being Jewish at all? And that's where Paul starts with this chapter. He says, to begin with, they have been entrusted with the oracles of God. I want to offer an illustration to help highlight this point. If Pastor Brent were to come to me and hand me a hundred dollar bill, and he told me it's money for Robin Kate's new church, church plant for Free City Church, and he wants me to deliver the money to them. He has entrusted me to deliver that $100. Now, if I go and break that $100 bill and only give Rob and Kate $75, I have not fulfilled what he entrusted me with. And this is what has happened with God and the Israelites. He entrusted them with his law. They were supposed to deliver that law to the rest of the world, showing all the pagan nations who the one true God was. And it was to be an invitation to spread the name of God across the world. But they failed, as we would have to. They kept the message or the $100 bill all to themselves. They used it as a special privilege for them as a nation. They said, look at us. We have this $100 bill that God gave us. We are special. But they didn't deliver the message. It would be as if a mailman used his bag of mail as a sign of what an important person he was instead of actually delivering the mail. So what is God to do? Well, despite their faithlessness, he remains true. The plan continues and he is faithful to fulfill his word that was promised to Abraham that all the nations of the world would be blessed because of him. He simply needs a faithful Israelite who will fulfill the commission and God will provide that himself. His name is Jesus, okay? that Jesus has fulfilled the law. Let's move on. Verse five, it says, but if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in human ways, by no means. For then how could God judge the world? These two verses were confusing to me the first time I read them. So I want to offer a quick, quick explanation. If we or Israel is in the wrong and God is in the right, it appears as if the two sides are opposing each other in a lawsuit. And this was actually the mistake of Job. He thought the bad things that happened to him pitted him and God against each other, and he thought he was righteous and should win, and that God wasn't being fair. But the point of the whole book of Job is that God is not an opposing party in a lawsuit with humans, God is transcendent and sovereign, even over the issues we find most puzzling. And so here, Paul is saying the same thing. No, God is not an opposing party to Israel or humans. Then he would be unrighteous to inflict wrath because he would be acting as judge in his own case. And so that's what verse 6 is meaning when it questions, 
how then could God judge the world? Moving to verse 7, But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. We see here that Paul that people are making accusations against Paul's teaching. The righteousness of God being revealed by faith alone is Paul's main teaching point, which is causing some people to say, well, what's the point in doing good at all then? In fact, if I do more evil, won't it make the goodness of God abound even more? Basically saying, I'm going to be really bad in order to create a great testimony. Paul quickly condemns that way of thinking, and it's something he'll come back to later in the book. These accusations also show us that Paul knew some of the people in Rome, and he even knew things they were saying about him. No, he hadn't ever visited Rome, but it's likely people from other cities that Paul had visited had then moved to Rome. Just a little context to note there. Moving to verse 9, it says, What then are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, including Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Okay, that's our memory verse for the week, Romans 3, verse 9. Paul now returns to the same question he opens a chapter with, which he appears to have a different answer to now. To be honest, I don't have a great explanation for that. It seems Jews do have some advantage having been entrusted with God's law, but at the same time, they aren't any better off. But verse 9 emphasizes our first highlighted point that I opened the video with, no one has lived up to the standard of God. We are all under sin. Notice here too that sin is mentioned not simply as an act of wrongdoing, but almost as a power that we are under. It's something that will be explored more later, but it should make us think twice about casually staying in sin. To help prove his point that all are under sin, Paul is going to quote several Old Testament passages. Verse 10, it says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. These three verses all come from Psalm chapter 14, verses 1 and 3. Verse 13, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Verse 13 comes from Psalm 5, 9, and also from Psalm 140, verse 3. Verse 14, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. This is coming from Psalm 10, 7. Verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood, and in their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. That comes from Isaiah 59, verses 7 and 8. And then verse 18 says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. The reference there is Psalm 36, verse 1. With all of these Old Testament quotes, it is more than Paul simply listing out verses to prove the point he's making. That's part of it. But also, anytime a New Testament author quotes the Old Testament, they also have the context of the whole chapter or even that Old Testament book in their mind. And so in all of these chapters, Paul quotes, there is a thread of redemption. So yes, he is proving the point that all of us are under sin, but he is also pointing to the hope of redemption through Jesus that we will begin talking about in detail next week. The last two verses for today. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The phrase, every mouth may be stopped in verse 19, it comes from a courtroom setting in Paul's day. In their world, if you're on trial and had nothing to say to defend yourself, you would put your hand over your mouth as a sign. And sometimes court officials would even hit a prisoner in the mouth to indicate that he is obviously guilty and shouldn't even be trying to defend himself. We actually see this happen to Jesus in John 18, 22 and to Paul in Acts 23, 2. So the law speaks and everyone who is under it has had their mouth stopped. They are guilty and have nothing to say in their defense. This means the whole world, Jews and Gentiles alike, 
may be rightfully held accountable by God. And if the law did nothing to bring about our justification, our right standing with God, what was the purpose of it? Well, verse 20 says that through the law comes the knowledge of sin, another point that Paul will further develop on in coming chapters. It is important to say okay, that all of humanity being guilty and deserving the wrath of God is our condition before we encounter Jesus and give our life to him. But since we are all guilty and everyone's mouth has been shut, okay, it will make us appreciate the gospel more in the coming chapters that Paul is going to speak to, the gospel that we're not ashamed of, right? Romans 1.16, and it'll give it even more meaning and beauty and implications for us if we understand our great need for it in the first place. And so that's all for this week. We finally made it through the wrath of God section of Romans. I'm so glad, Kay, that we're going to start a new part next week that is a little bit more hopeful, a little bit more exciting. And so I'll see you next week for that in the remainder of chapter three. See you then. <laughs>